in that likely skipped thing and wondering what that was all about. Well, I had things to do this morning. I mean, I have things to do every morning. But uh, in this case, it was uh, doctors related things and I wasn't sure how long it was going to take. Uh, I also have slightly modified certain aspects of how I'm doing things audio-wise, but that won't be making an impact, I believe, this week. I just haven't really had the time to set that, that side up. But... I, did, I can't actually see that, that emulator screen right now, so... That one was pure luck. And we can see my uh, my mouse. It is uh, it's not being shown in the right spot. So that's uh, that's that's real good. I'm just gonna disable uh, the mouse being shown if it's if it's not gonna grab it in the right spot. It uh, it will be more distracting. I know the reason for it. OBS doesn't like scaling. With how important the second screen is for stuff, I probably should have had these at more equal sizes. Now, while 999 is a visual novel, first and foremost, um, I'm not 100% certain if I should read these. Eh, screw it. If, if I'm not reading it, it'll be a lot of dead air. A loud noise startled Junpei awake, and his eyes snapped open. As they adjusted to the light, he realized that he didn't recognize his surroundings. Ow. With a crack, Junpei's head connected with something metal. He rolled over and threw out his hand to steady himself, but he found himself groping at open, empty air. His balance lost, and his still fuzzy mind struggling to understand what was going on, Junpei tumbled down to the cold, gray floor. Ouch, goddammit. What the hell? Junpei, Junpei glared around the room, still trying to determine when, where he'd woken up. The fall had shaken the last cobwebs of sleep from his mind, and finally un he understood where he'd fallen from. It was a bed. A three-level bunk bed, in fact. Junpei had fallen, apparently, from the topmost bunk. His shoulder hurt, his knee hurt, his hip hurt, his entire body hurt. He'd feel a bump forming, forming on his forehead where he'd slammed it against the low ceiling. He wondered if that bump was the reason he felt his vision wavering a bit, but that seemed unlikely. At first, he thought the tremor that ran through his legs was just another effect of his rude awakening, but as he looked around, he realized it was real. The whole room was shaking. Was it an earthquake, he wondered? It didn't seem likely. It was shaking far too quickly for an earthquake. Then again, Junpei had no idea what it was, if not an earthquake. He tried to tell himself it was important. Junpei rubbed the growing bump on his head and gingerly climbed to his feet. His balance regained, he finally took his first good look around the room. And muttered to himself, Where am I? His pain momentarily forgotten in the face of the confusion of the circumstances, Junpei looked around the room once again. Minutes passed while Junpei struggled to get his bearings. Then, as suddenly as they had begun, the tremors ceased. A cold silence fell over the room. From somewhere far away, Junpei could hear the sound of metal squeaking. He felt his stomach tighten. There were a thousand things the sound could have been, 
but none of the things he could think of were good. In an attempt to distract himself, Junpei looked around the room once more. There was a stove that looked more antique than functional. The three-level bunk bed had mattresses that were so thin that they were little more than blankets. On the other side of the room was an identical bed, and set in the wall between the beds was a slightly dirty iron door. First thing Junpei noticed about the door was the number roughly emblazoned across it. On the surface of the door, in red paint, someone had written, Five. I, I can't pronounce those brackets. Although I suppose they're just left and right brackets. What's this five mean? Suspicious and still utterly confused, Junpei approached the door slowly. Like I'm going to be approaching my door right now because I need to turn on my fan. Shutting the door of a tiny room with electronics on, quite a bit of electronics on really, um, and having the heater on, eats up a tiny room quickly. Standing at last in front of the door, Junpei grabbed hold of the L-shaped handle. Not sure why they're calling attention to the shape here. Push yielded no movement and a pull the same result. A few more tries cemented the truth in Junpei's mind. It would not open. Didn't matter how much he pushed and shoved, the handle wouldn't budge. Next to the door was an odd-looking device that reminded Junpei of a card reader. I mean, I kind of get it. There's like a, a card slide on the left. Didn't take a genius to figure out that, uh, that the odd-looking device was keeping the door shut. Junpei knocked hard on the door. Hey, hello. Is anyone there? Open the door. I'm not going to be shouting. There was no response. Junpei threw his left fist into the door. And stopped. What the hell is this? He wasn't really sure what else to say. On his left wrist was a bracelet of a sort he'd never seen before. In the center was a large LCD display. It looked like nothing else so much as a watch, but it clearly wasn't that. After all, it showed only a single number. Five. That's... That's the same as the door. True. The numbers were the same, but he had no idea what that might mean. All he knew was that it was strange and new, and he wanted it off. Junpei flipped his hand over as if to remove a watch, but... The other side of the bracelet was solid. No buckle, no clasp, nothing. Well, I mean, there's, there's clearly a clasp, but just you don't have access to it. Like, if, if, you know, we could see at either angle, there's probably screws there, we just also don't have a screwdriver. And yes, I am that asshole that will be annoyed at this point. He sighed and flipped the thing back over. There were a number of rivets around the rim of the face, perhaps. I mean, they're probably buttons. Like, there's potentially three buttons on the top, three buttons on the bo bottom, and, and a button on either side. On a watch, they might be at dials... F oh, he pushed them, but nothing happened. On a watch, they might be dials for adjusting date or time, but on this bracelet, they did nothing. Junpei was at a loss. What was he going to do? Growing more desperate, he began to tug at it. However... Urgh. Damn. Ugh, it's no good. Damn thing won't come off. A steel ring ran from the face, around Junpei's wrist, and back into the face. He wouldn't be pulling the bracelet off any time in the near future. What the hell is the deal with this thing? 
Frustration and desperation were beginning to mix as the reality of the situation began to fu dawn fully on Junpei. You mean like the fact that he's in an area he's never been before? Too much was happening and none of it made sense. Junpei felt as though he were about to explode. You know, this is this is my first time playing the game in, in like a decade. But that's a, that's a pretty good bit of foreshadowing there. Where am I? And why the hell am I here? Why? Why? What the hell happened to me? It was at that moment that he noticed the window. The window was round, rimmed in riveted brass, like a window from an early 20th century ship. What? Wait, am I in a ship? Junpei walked slowly toward the window. He could see nothing beyond it but thick, impenetrable darkness. Junpei squinted, trying to see something, anything. It was at that moment that the damn thing started cracking. What the? You gotta be kidding me. What the hell is going on here? And that's the end of our story. Rex split the glass of the window, and for a moment Junpei stared at it. Then the window burst, and water began to pour into the room. What the hell? God damn it. Junpei yelled and spun around. His feet slipping on the water already coming through the window, he ran for the door. Hey, anyone. Is anyone there? Come on, if you're there, say something. There was no reply. As Junpei screamed and pounded on the door, the water began to rise. It was now ankle deep on the floor, and rising quickly towards his knees. Things were not looking good for Junpei. Not good at all. He needed to find a way out, and quickly. I also like that little bit of foreshadowing, and it's, it's not meaningful foreshadowing, but the uh, little puzzle segments are called you get a big thing that sells, tells you, find a way out. I think. It has actually been a decade since I've played this, so. Well, not quite, but close enough. Uh, Junpei ran a hand across his forehead, brushing the sweat out of his eyes, and looked around the room. Oh, seek a way out. Uh... Now, first and foremost, I want to qualify this by stating this game is not great. The writing is pretty good, especially for the time. This was uh, 2010. Um, 2010, I did not play a lot of games. Basically, I ended up purchasing two games. And that was really all I had time for. Now, I made good choices. I played 999, and I played Fallout New Vegas. I think that the impact on of those on the fact that I kind of came back to games with a major appreciating appreciation for the writing side is uh, kind of owing to those two games. Now, I will also be taking a specific path through this. Um, first time I played, I didn't have any kind of guide. Um, huh. That uh, that may end up being an issue because it does need its save data. If necessary, I can always replay this game with a different version of the emulator. It will not be too, too time consuming uh, to do 
while not uh, not reading everything out loud for the stream. Uh, but I got a specific path. It's actually the path that almost everybody who writes a walkthrough or, or uh, you know, tells other people about it says, don't fucking do it. Don't, don't take this specific path. But here's the thing, if I hadn't taken that path, I'd have never been interested in the fucking game in the slightest. Also, is, is there an option to speed up the, the text? I know there is for the later games. I don't know if there is for this one. Um. Oh, actually, I think I know what that may be. Hmm. No, looks like there's no... If there was, it would have been in the option screen prior. And of course, this looks very much like a, a static thing because it's not actually timed. Um, I, I do enjoy it, but there, it, you know, even this kind of kills the sense of timing being meaningful. Too late, I already did it. Um, the, the puzzle side. I don't remember any of the puzzles being particularly difficult. Uh, at least partially because in this game, there is no... Yeah, we need both parts of the code. In this game, there's no meaningful... like, extra clues. Your, the clues that you get are... all important, as I recall. Here I'm trying to investigate all the, the pillows. Yeah, you could at least take a look at the damn pillow. And the uh, first time I played, it took me a while to notice that red key. Because it, 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 on a DS, when it's not being scaled up, and it may have been like this on the, the little screen as well, um, the key is very difficult to look at and say, say that it's definitely a key and not like a crack. Okay, so his confusion was well justified. His face was drawn and pale and the dark circles under his eyes made him look as though he was nearly dead. Man, what the hell happened to me? How did I end up here? Even as he said it, something in his mind opened, and a memory bobbed to the surface. It was the last thing Junpei remembered before waking up in the strange room.
It was past midnight when he came home. Also, I could 100% relate to fucking Junpei in this uh, when I was playing it. Because between working and I think this was when I was going to be doing grad school. Oh, I just never had the fucking time for anything. Junpei shuffled up the stairs and opened the door to apartment 201. And no, I did not actually successfully finish that. Inside was his apartment, a small one-bedroom affair that ran him about $630 a month. He moved into it when he entered college, and so far he'd been there for three years and seven months. He stepped inside and turned on the lights. The fluorescent lights on the ceiling blinked and flickered slowly to life, as if waking from a deep slumber. Their cold light illuminated the landscape he'd come home to so many times before. Everything was as he'd left it. The magazines piled up in the corner, the textbooks collecting dust, the CD cases covering the floor, the jeans and t-shirt he'd worn the day before, then tossed onto the floor. There was one thing that didn't belong, however. There was also a breeze. Breaths of cold night air wafted into his apartment, carrying the smells of autumn with them. The white curtain framing his window swayed gently in the wind. Huh, that's weird. Did I leave that open? Junpei walked toward the window, trying to remember if he'd close it or not, before he left. One of the panes was hanging open. He stuck his head out and looked around. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Junpei shrugged. He must have just left it open earlier. He closed the window. Then it happened. I actually kind of like, even though it's, it's a bad effect, I kind of like that, uh, Refocusing to show the masked man in the, the the window. Junpei turned and found himself face to mask with a man dressed all in black. The man wore a deep hood and a bulky gas mask. His face was entirely hidden. Junpei tried to scream, but all he could manage was a strangled croak. He tried to step towards the man, but his legs could no longer support his weight. Junpei collapsed to the floor, a crumpled heap of limbs like a discarded puppet. Too late, he noticed the white smoke that was quickly filling his apartment. A small object, shaped distressingly like a grenade, sat on the floor in front, of his, in front of his face, hissing. The white smoke poured out of it at an incredible rate. The smoke had grown so thick that the details of Junpei's apartment began to fade into the white haze. He could feel his mind begin to fade as well, a white haze that was not the smoke creeping into the edges of his vision. Consider this a privilege. You have been chosen. A rasping voice wormed its way out of the gas mask. I can't do voices anyway, so... It was cold and harsh and distorted in some way that Junpei couldn't put his finger on. It was definitely auto-tuned. A hundred percent. Also, when I inevitably actually bother to purchase the Steam version of this, if it's not auto-tuned, I am going to be so goddamn disappointed. You are going to participate in a game. The Nonary Game. It is a game where you will put your life on the line. That was the last thing Junpei remembered. The white smoke overpowered him, the masked man faded from his vision, and he felt his consciousness fall away into the white mist. That's right, that guy with the gas mask. That son of a bitch must have taken me here. As to who the man was, or might have been, Junpei had no idea. Indeed, he wasn't even sure that his assailant had been a man. Although, well, I'm... Junpei could be on the small side, but realistically, assuming that Junpei is an, of an average size, it would be very difficult to, you know, take him without being noticed, regardless of gender. So most likely it's two people, at which point in time, gender doesn't matter quite so much. The voice had been cold and mechanical, likely passed through a voice changer, and the body had been covered in a thick cloak. 
Also, they hurt somehow, well, angles and all, but look like they're probably shorter than Junpei. Who was the man in the mask? You have been chosen. Junpei remembered that much, but also all this is taking place while Junpei is in a thing that's about to leave him drowning and dead. So, you know, Junpei is real fucking smart. What it might mean? That was beyond him. Junpei had no idea where he was or why he was there. There was only one thing from his memory that seemed important. You are going to participate in a game. The Nonary Game. It is a game where you will put your life on the line. Nonary game, huh? What the hell is a nonary game? God damn it. With a yell, Junpei drove his fist into the mirror. Oh, sure, this one is the one we need to get the damn thing for. Okay, so... Blue is filled square, upper left empty triangle. Lower left filled triangle, upper right empty triangle. And I'm not gonna fucking remember those. So, zero. Two. Six. Yeah, it's just clicking on him. Well, in this case, it's clicking on him when it was... Uh, with the stylus, it was tap them with the stylus. Alright, let's see if these numbers work. A turn of the key, and hey, looks like it's working. Yes! Alright, let's up- wait. Did the prior part, when it was immediately prior to that, actually have Junpei up top, or was it ambiguous? Was it like a fucking narrator? A file? What are we, Resident Evil? If you find any documents or notes during the escape, the information on them will be available from the file screen. To open the file screen, touch File, or R, in the top right of the bottom screen. Once the file screen, select files by touching them, or press the D-pad. It wasn't actually showing a button there. If you touch Search, the contents of the file you select will be displayed in the upper screen. Alright, let's see what's in this file. Hmm, digital root. Let's see here. Compute a digital root with the following steps. First, add all the numbers in question to one another. If you end up with something greater than a single digit number, add the digits to one another. So on and so forth. If you have a double digit number, add the number in the tens place and the number in the ones place. Blah, 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 blah. That final single digit is your digital root. The digital root of 6, 7, 8 would be, I think, 3. Digital root of 1, 2, 3, 4 would be... I really don't give a shit, but it's going to be 1. So just keep adding numbers until you get back to the digital root. Oh, looks like there's something on the back of this. Now, I believe we're not yet at the point where any of this is meaningful. Also, I think we still need to find the red. Um, and of course, digital root was mentioned because we need to have something that comes up to a digital root of five. bulletin board. There's nothing on it. Huh. Cal next to the sink. 
Doesn't seem like there's anything in the sink. Only drain in this room. Nothing on top of the shelf. Pipe. I know, I'll crawl into the pipe and find a way out. Ah, here's the red one. Well, let's look at our items real quick. So it is upper left filled, lower right empty. So seven four. Eight five, seven four eight five. That's just like the blue briefcase. Somewhere around here is a red key. Let's give it a shot. God damn it, why are we given the, the these instructions again? I seem to recall that the uh, the next game uh, was a bit better about its puzzles not uh, always giving you the tutorial. So we have one, two, three. And I think that's probably four, five, six. I got a little bit worried there. Um, because I accidentally touched the edge of the screen and resized it a tiny amount. So, we need to figure out something to get a Digital root of five. Oops. I don't know why it needs to be three of them. Oh, I guess it's six, seven, eight, and one, two, three. But. Oh, yeah. That is me being dumb. There's probably another solution to that. I wasn't really, you know, willing to sit there and keep thinking about it. Time to go. And yeah, I'm, I'm super inconsistent about actually saying the, uh, the lines that are on screen. Accompanied by a wall of angry water, Junpei shot out of the room and into the opposing wall where he was promptly crushed to death. And we get a game over. Gasping to catch his breath, he looked around. He was in a narrow hallway. The water that had followed him out of the room was rapidly pouring out of the door. It flowed quickly down the hallway and slammed to the foot of the short flight of stairs. Stairs. Just five steps, in fact. At the top of the short staircase, a door. Another door. Junpei le leapt up the stairs straight for the door. The door burst open, and Junpei exploded out of it, only to freeze in his tracks. What other possible response could there have been to what he saw? W what the hell? His voice trailed off, and all he could do was stare. Polished floors stretched out before him, ornate staircases rising up from the edges, each one of them equidistant from the others. The stairs and pillars were solid wood. 
and Art Nouveau embellishments and decorations covered the walls and pillars. It looked like nothing so much as the entrance to a luxurious mansion from the early 1900s. Junpei couldn't help but wonder. Was he really in a ship? The water quickly filling the hallway behind him suggested that yes, he was. As he looked, a fresh wave rolled out of the room he'd been in, gathering speed as it moved towards the stairs. Yeah, that's, that's what I thought. This is totally a boat. Wait, what the hell? A wave? Shit, I gotta get out of here. Junpei spun around, his wet shoes squeaking in protest on the polished floor, and ran toward the tremendous staircase in front of him. Sea deck. Sea deck. As he ran, he glanced quickly at the plates mounted on the wall, denoting the decks of the ship. He took the stairs two at a time, not entirely sure where he would find himself. Just as he began to wonder where, in fact, the stairs did lead, Junpei saw another person out of the corner of his eye. So, we got... one person that belongs on a boat out of five so far. He stopped short, nearly tripping over the next stair, and looked. It wasn't just one person he'd seen. On the landing to the left of the stairs, there were four people staring at him. And on the right side, three more. All told, there were seven of them. It looked as though they had been on their way down the stairs. They'd stopped short when they saw Junpei, their eyes wide. Well, with 999 as the title, we're still missing one person. He'd done the same, of course, and now they stood there staring at one another. Junpei didn't move, one foot placed awkwardly on the next step in the middle of a stride. Who were these people? Well, Junpei, given that they are just as confused as you are, probably people in the same circumstance. This entire interaction lasted only a matter of seconds. The woman spoke to Junpei, and time began to move again. I guess there's another one of us now. The woman was dressed, Junpei thought, rather like a dancer. Yeah, that's that's probably a more positive way of, of stating it than... Uh, I thought first time, or thought last time that I saw her. By last time, I mean 10 seconds ago. Her clothes covered very little, and her prodigious jewelry a little more. Hey you, come on. Hurry. With no further ceremony, she ran straight past Junpei and towards the doors behind him. The sudden proximity of a woman which, with such striking assets left Junpei temporarily stunned. Yeah. Yep, Junpei's a goon. But the others wasted no time and quickly followed the strange woman. The first to pass Junpei was a young man with silver hair. He threw a quick glance in Junpei's direction as he ran, muttering, Hmm, one of us, huh? Following him was an older man, his face calm and without fear. Soft, soft wrinkles sprouted from his eyes, and he came close enough as he passed for Junpei to see wisps of gray in his hair. His composure and shock of hair struck Junpei as, a, as rather like that of an elderly lion. The worthless? Going up won't do you any good. There are two doors, but neither of them will open. The next to speak was a girl with pink hair and a high voice. Come on. And I only just noticed that they... I think this is one of those things where I'm noticing more things because uh, having headphones on. Uh, the... Little... Digital voice thing. Um, the parser. Is high-pitched for her lines. Aren't you coming? You gotta hurry. Her small hand was wrapped around the wrist of another man. 
His eyes were closed, almost as though he were sleeping. His features was graceful. His features were graceful, almost serene, and he was dressed rather elegantly for someone his age. Something about his posture seemed very refined, and Junpei couldn't help feeling he was noble and dignified somehow. He'd certainly never seen one, but this man seemed like what Junpei had always imagined a prince would be like. That's nine of us, then. Princes are bad at math. All of the cards are in hand. What does all of the cards are in hand mean, he wondered. Well, it's just like the damn cards that you literally just picked up, Junpei. Junpei opened his mouth to ask what the other man had meant. The girl with pink hair rushed past him and they were gone. He turned just in time to see two more people running toward him. One of them had hair like a bird's nest and looked as though a sti stiff breeze might topple him. And the other was a veritable mountain of a man. The scrawny one said nothing and scuttled past Junpei as though he were running from something. Hey, what the hell are you just standing there for? Didn't you hear him? The doors on A deck are no good. We gotta check the doors on B deck. Got it? Now go. Before he had a chance to respond, the man laid a massive hand on Junpei's shoulder. With no more effort than Junpei would have used to brush aside a fly, the man shoved him out of the way. Whoa. Thrown off balance by the man in the recent events, it took Junpei a few seconds to get his bearings. He finally regained his balance and looked up at what the other seven had been running toward. More digital roots. Uh, there were five. There were two pairs of large iron doors set into the wall in front of him. I said five because, of course, one of the doors has five on it. They looked quite sturdy, and each had handles jut jutting out from them. Written across the surface, each door in red paint was a number. Whoops. That's what happens if you hit Y accidentally. The door on the right had a 4. The door on the left had a 5. They're the same. No, no, 4 and 5 are different numbers. The guy Junpei had decided to call Silver was mumbling to himself. The room I woke up in had a number on the door, just like that. Just like that. You too, eh? With an arched eyebrow, the lion looked over at Silver. My cell was the same, a number upon the door. I opened it, ran down the hallway outside, found myself in the rather grand room full of stairs, as I suspect did the rest of you. It was as though the floodgates had begun to open, had been opened. They all began to talk at once. Me too. I did too. Yeah, door with a number on it. it. Soon became clear that each of them had woken in a door with a lock room, solved a puzzle to escape. They'd all ended up in the same room, almost as though they'd been guided there. Speaking is difficult. Yes, we all saw the same thing. That's not important. We need to hurry. You think I don't know that, lady? Before the dancer had time to finish, Silver was already running. He grabbed hold of the door labeled 5 and pulled. And to exactly nobody's surprise, it doesn't open. However, fuck, it's not opening. This damn thing won't even budge. Move. You're in the way. The mountain grabbed Silver's shoulder and tossed him aside. His path cleared, he took a few steps back and threw himself at the door. You know, I wonder if that would have worked for the uh, the regular doors in the, the first puzzle room. Once, twice, three times, four times. The door shook as his body slammed into it, but showed no signs of breaking or opening. The mountain threw himself at the door again. Junpei turn turn. Junpei turned towards door four. Next to the door on the wall was a small box. It looked just like the one he'd seen in his room next to that door. If it was the same, then this door was likely locked as well. Also, what the hell does vacant mean? Still, he had to check. 
Junpei grabbed a handle and threw all of his weight into it. Roar. I rather like the creaking there. Yeah. It was locked as tight as the door next to it, as he'd expected. Suspected. Damn it. Junpei punched the door. It did not respond. It would be ta excuse me, it would be terrifying if it did. Were these the only doors, he wondered? He'd barely finished the thought when the sea deck plate he'd passed on his way up sprang, unbidden, to his mind. His body moved before he had time to think. Junpei turned and ran back towards the stairs. He had scarcely taken a step when at the top of the stairs next to an ornate clock embedded in the wall, he saw a person. It's the ninth person. It was a girl. She looked to be the same age as Junpei. He froze, unable to look away from her face. He wasn't confounded by her beauty or something equally silly. No, there was another reason he couldn't take his eyes off the girl. Junpei had seen her somewhere before. So functionally, the same goddamn thing as confounded by her beauty. Thanks, game. He couldn't quite remember where, but he knew. He knew he'd met her before. The girl, too, stared at Junpei, similarly stunned. Her response suggested she'd seen, him, she, she'd seen him before as well. Without saying a word, Junpei walked slowly toward her. She didn't move. It was almost as though she was held in place by some sort of magic spell. No, I didn't say that this made me think that, you know, made me more interested in the game writing because it was filled with good writing. I just want to make that clear. As Junpei st stepped onto her landing, the spell broke. No sooner had he set his foot down than the whole ship shook a second time. That's actually difficult to say. That's not me fucking it up for once. That one was actually difficult to say. Ah. You know, it wasn't obvious. Well, I suppose it had to be the, the girl. The quake caught the girl unprepared, and she fell. Moving on instinct, Junpei leapt to catch her. This is going to end up with some dumb anime thing. Or so he thought. Her face was far closer than it should have been, mere inches from his own. He was flat on his back, and she had landed squarely on top of him. The girl seemed as confused as he did, and her face suggested she still hadn't fully recovered from seeing him. For a moment that seems to, seemed to stretch for a very long time, they stared at one another. Ship stopped shaking. Screw you too, game. Everything was quiet. Water could be heard from the bottom of the ship, lapping faintly at walls and ceilings, but eventually that faded as well. The silence was complete. A thick, muffling blanket. And in traditional anime form, we're about to see something really dumb. At last, the girl opened her mouth. Oh my gosh, is that you, Jumpy? Jumpy. Jumpy. Her words echoed through Junpei's head, and suddenly his memory returned. A Akane? Why hadn't he realized it before? The girl was Akane Kurishiki. She and Junpei had been friends in childhood. They'd gone to elementary school together for six years. But what was she doing on the ship? Her soft eyes were only inches away from his own. He could feel the warmth of her face. Feelings he'd thought long forgotten began to work their way to the surface. He could feel his face heating up. At that moment, a speaker crackled to life and a cold, eerie voice filled the room. Welcome aboard. I welcome you all from the bottom of my heart to this, my vessel. With the voice's invasion, the spell between Junpei and Akane was broken, and all hints of burgeoning romance instantly forgotten. Thank God. They hurriedly untangled themselves from one another and struggled to their feet. And that's not a I have something against romances, I have something against terrible anime romances. 
Their seven companions had ver heard the voice as well, and many of their faces had gone pale. They looked around frantically, desperate to locate the source of the voice. At last, they found it. A speaker set in the ceiling. A traditional ass speaker at that. I am Zero, the captain of this ship. I am also the person who invited you here. The voice was harsh, obscured occasionally by the crackle of static. But Junpei recognized it. How could he have forgotten it? It was the same voice he had heard from the man in the gas mask. Hey, asshole, what the hell is this? Come on out here, I want to get a look at you. What do you mean to do to us? I mean to have you participate in a game. Some of you I know are familiar with this game. Well, that seems like a really shitty way if it's, if it's going to be competitive. The Nonary Game. It is a game where you will put your life on the line. Well, that kind of inherently makes it competitive. Nonary Game? What the hell's that? The voice continued. Implacable. Actually, I don't know how to pronounce that word, thinking about it. You know, that's one of those things that I probably should look up sometime. I'm not going to. Mind. But I probably should. The rules of the nonary game can be found upon your persons. They are simple rules. Read them. Nonary game? Hey, there's something in my pocket. Check this out. Silver reached into his pocket and pulled out a small slip of paper. The rest of them reached into their own pockets and pulled out similar slips of paper. Aside from the dancer, whose outfit had no pockets. Actually, yeah, probably. And likely Akane as well. Junpei followed suit and dug into the pockets of his pants. He felt the telltale crumple of paper, slightly damp from his earlier ordeal. And if you can read much of anything on that, you are definitely better at reading this than I can. Actually, that's... We will call them the... I can't read that. The doors in front of you are a... You know, it probably is actually going to be... Would you mind terribly reading it to us, young man? His request had been delivered to Junpei, who, after a short moment of surprise, did as he had been asked. On the ship, you will hand find a handful of doors emblazoned with numbers. We will call them the numbered doors. The doors in front of you are a pair of the same. Yeah, it looks like this is the same thing that was written on there, just without the... There, there was a first line missing on the uh, letter. The key to opening these numbered doors are the numbered bracelets that each of you possess. Should you total the numbers on your numbered bracelets and find that the digital root of that number is equal to the number of that door, the door will open. Only those who have opened the door may pass through. There are, however, limits. Only three to five people can pass through one numbered door. All those who enter must leave, and all who enter must contribute. Bracelet Junpei figured had to figure had to mean the bulky thing on his wrist. Glanced around, it looked like everyone else had one as well, and had come to much the same conclusion. The purpose of the game is simple. Leave the ship alive. It is hidden, but an exit can be found. Seek a way out. Seek a door that carries a nine. Junpei had reached the end of the letter. There was a long moment of silence, and then the speaker crackled to life once more. There is one last thing I must tell you. As you have no doubt surmised, this ship has begun to sink. On April 14th, 1912, the famous ocean liner Titanic crashed into an iceberg. After remaining afloat for 2 hours and 40 minutes, it sank beneath the waters of the North Atlantic. I will give you more time. 9 hours. That is the time you will be given to make your escape. 
you know, this is one of those things where I kind of wish there was an actual, like, nine-hour timer in-game. Uh, on the other hand, this game is definitely not nine hours to get through a, a path. The voice finished and the speaker went silent. The sound of a bell tolling echoed through the hall. It came from the dance hall adjacent to the stairwell. It took those assembled on the st st stairs mere moments to trace the sound to an antique clock embedded in the wall. Seven, eight, nine. The sound of the ninth bell faded away. The tenth never came. That meant the time was nine o'clock. Most likely nine o'clock in the evening. And, as I understand that, that is very much an American thing. Um... And specifically, U.S. I believe most of the world, even at this point in time, uh, had gone to, if not entirely a 24-hour clock, uh, mostly moving away from the a.m. p.m. side. When Junpei peered, had peered out of the window of his cell, he'd seen nothing but blackness. It had to be nighttime. If that was the case, they would need to, be, to escape by 6 a.m. the following day. And they're all well-rested following their sleep from gas. Definitely well rested. Definitely not going to need to sleep in the next nine hours. Now it is time. Let our game begin. I wish you all the best of luck, aside from the ones that I want to die. Which Zero definitely wants some people to die. Zero's a dick. The speaker went silent and did not speak again. And a cough. Interesting. Did that pop up when I first hit that as well? Um, well. Silver yelled at the speaker with language coarse enough to embarrass a sailor, but the rest of Junpei's companions were silent, deep in thought. I mean, I hit that originally because I, bet I was about to cough. Uh, there was a great deal he didn't understand. Who was Zero? What was the Nonary game? Why had he chosen to make them part of it? Who profited? Wait, no. Was he a criminal who took delight in playing with his victims? Or did he have some other purpose? And why had Junpei been chosen as part of this insane game? Why had any of them been chosen? Well, one question was foremost on his mind. Akane. They hadn't seen one another since elementary school. Which really makes it seem like they're, you know, high schoolers. I mean, okay, even if you're extending this out to, like, 6th grade or something. If it's been, like, a handful of years, I wouldn't recognize anybody I knew in, in elementary school. Why had she appeared now? Coincidence? No, that seemed impossible. There had to be a reason. He didn't know what it might be, but there had to be a reason. Very well. The lion's voice seemed oddly loud in the silence. Standing around here won't do us any good. Best we get moving, don't you think? Get moving? Are you planning to open the numbered doors? Hey, wait. Don't tell me you're actually going to do this. What this zero says. No, no, that's not what I mean. The lion shook his head, mildly annoyed. I'm saying, let's find another way. After all, we haven't really examined this place yet. We... what? And thus they wasted eight hours dicking around. Their separate investigations finished, all nine people returned to where they'd left one another. 
the result of all their work was nothing. They were completely sealed in. Their hard work had not completely gone to waste. They had learned a number of things that they, as they'd scoured the parts of the ship they could reach. It seems that they were confined to decks, decks A through C. C deck was as far down as they would be able to go, however. The reason being, D deck was flooded. D deck was completely submerged. Strangely, however, the water had risen no higher than D deck. The flow seems to have been stopped somehow, as evidenced by the surface of the water on D-deck, which was as smooth as glass. The prince knelt down and gently drew his hand across it, which didn't help him any because he was fucking blind. Or lacking eyes. Maybe that's why he's the prince. His eyes were taken. Now I'm thinking of those... Terrible games that Yahtzee made. Perhaps this Zero fellow has used some sort of a remote control to seal a watertight door lower down. He, he said that our time limit was nine hours. In other words, this water won't rise for nine hours. Not entirely what I would get out of that. There could be time limits on a door-by-door door basis, or a floor-by-floor floor basis. Then you're saying we won't sink until then? Well, that may be a little too optimistic. No point for wishful thinking. There were three metal doors on C-deck. A single door stood off to the side with two more on the wall facing the central staircase. None of them had numbers or verification devices. They were, however, locked like the other doors. No matter how much they push and shove, the doors refuse to move. The mountain and the lion threw themselves against them a few times, but to no avail. The door in the back had a keyhole. Just above it was a strange mark in the shape of a circle surrounding a dot. There were two other doors on C-deck as well, but it was clear they were elevators as each button next to it, as each had a button next to it with an upside down triangle. They tried pushing the button, no response. Apparently, there was no power running to the elevators. To the left of the elevator doors was a card reader. Is that Sagittarius? The card reader also had a strange mark on it. it. Looked like a lowercase h with a dash drawn across the upper stem of the h. Junpei stared at it for a while. Okay, I was wrong as hell. This is the symbol of Saturn. It's an astrological symbol. Actually, I might not be wrong, but it's it's really not important. And the mark on the other door, I think that was the sun symbol. They had seen the same symbols on a deck. You can actually kind of see the sun symbol in the back here. I think that's supposed to be a clock, but... Uh, there was a door on either side of the stairs. The one on the left had a keyhole with a similar symbol engraved on it. Earth symbol. The horizontal line symbolizes the equator, and the vertical one represents the prime meridian. Junpei looked up at the ceiling. There was a great circle cut in it, perhaps for a skylight or a glass dome, but it had been filled in with a gargantuan metal plate. The metal looked very solid. Anything short of an explosive charge was unlikely to damage it. There were several windows along both sides of the ship, at least there had been. They too were covered with metal plates. In other words... This lukewarm uh, energy drink I'm drinking is really tasting awful. We're trapped, all the exits go nowhere. Junpei was not happy. The girl with pink hair spoke up. Well, I'm sure they go somewhere, we just can't open them. Yeah, that's that's kind of what locked doors tend to do. Then the mountain spoke. You don't know that. For all they, we know, they just open into walls or take us in circles. Prince did not agree. No, I'm sure they go somewhere. Otherwise, what point would there be? 
Well, it could be a maze or a trap or a trick or I just dropped my pencil. And we can open them. You know, the, the prince is really not making himself seem smart. Well, two of them at least. You mean the numbered doors? All eyes turn towards the doors with numbers on them. The atmosphere in the room grew tense. Hey, wait a minute. I think I said this earlier, but I don't think we should do that. The dancer moved in front of the doors as if to block them. We'd have to be crazy to open these doors. I don't know where that lisp came from. If we do that, we're doing exactly what Zero wants us to do. Giving ourselves a chance to survive? Suddenly, everyone began to speak at once. I'm really not going to get far enough into this to uh, actually demonstrate what I'm trying to do this time. I agree. I don't. That's a terrible idea. We should keep going. We should stay here. We don't have any other way to open any of these doors. We should just wait. Someone's bound to come find us. Yes, because... Things in the middle of the ocean have never, you know, been sitting there unfound for, for days plus at a time. We don't have time for that. In eight and a half hours, the ship is going to sink. No, no, in eight and a half hours, the ship is going to be sunk. It's a minor difference. But it's one of those things of, in eight and a half hours, the ship is going to sink, suggests that there will be time spent sinking. And it's, it's a game, so that's really not going to be the case. But the clamor of voices made it next to impossible to determine who was saying what. Their arguments grew more and more intense until people were shouting and screaming at one another. Junpei had remained silent, but at last he could take no more. Hey, shut up. And then Junpei had lost all thought. They fell silent and all eyes turned towards Junpei. He felt each stare burning into him, but he refused to flinch. Before he we a good beak. Before we try and decide where we're going to go, there's something else we ought to do. What's that? We need to exchange information. Who the hell is anybody else? We don't know anything about each other. I want to know who you guys are. Who you are, where you came from, why you ended up here. Don't tell me you weren't curious too. They were silent. Some of them looked the other way, bit their lip, crossed their arms, and stared at the ceiling. One of them spoke up. It was Akane. I agree. I think Jumpy is right. Jumpy? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm talking about him. I just call his, him Jumpy. His name is Junpei. We're childhood friends. We went to the same elementary school. Wait, stop. Don't tell us stuff we didn't ask you about. Zero's probably watching us right now. What are you going to do if he's listening? He probably knows your goddamn names if he can fucking kidnap you. Would that be bad? Well, yeah, it would. We don't know how much that bastard knows about us. Maybe he just picked a bunch of random people to kidnap. Well, when he was rifling through your pockets to put that information there, he could have just looked at your wallets. If that is the case, then it'd be dangerous for us to let him know too much. If Zero knows who we are... He could go after our families, like he could if he had discovered our personal information that's included in our identification cards. Or driver's license. Maybe he'd tell us he had them to get us to do stuff, you know? But we still need to know what our names are. 
It's going to be hard to talk to each other if we don't have names. Alright, then why don't we have code names? To him, apparently it seemed like the obvious solution. Code names? Yeah, we'll each pick something. Like, I'll be seven. God, I'm, I'm really hoping he doesn't have seven on his, his band. Seven? Why are you seven? It seemed a fair question. The mountain struck at his left arm. Damn. That... Wait. That arm doesn't seem to match up with that outfit, I don't think. Okay, I want to punch you in the face for this one. Because I remember this one. Alright, I'm going to be Santa. Any of you chumps Jap know Japanese? No, well, San means three, so I'll be Santa. Ow. You know, like Santa Claus. Fits, don't you think? Yeah, it's got a three on it. Good job, Grandpa. Just like the mountain had done, Silver thrusts out his left hand. Sure enough, the face of his bracelet read three. Very well, then. I'll go next, shall I? My bracelet number is one. Given that, I think ace seems appropriate. I'll be Lotus, then, as I'm sure you all know it has eight petals. I had no idea, but sure. Which means, of course, that my bracelet number is eight. For some reason, I was expecting her to have more rings or for the rings to be more gaudy than they are. I would appreciate it if you called me Snake. Or Snake Eyes. My bracelet number is two. Since Ace has chosen cards, then I choose Dice, Snake Eyes, clearly. Which is particularly relevant given that I am blind. The whole character descriptor of him is that he never opens his eyes. Gee, I wonder. Blind, really. He kept his eyes closed during their entire ordeal, which had suggested something strange, but to hear it said so casually, something of a surprise. Everyone seemed a little nervous at the prince's proclamation, but no one seemed to know how to react to it. I mean, how the fuck does he know that it's two? Were the instructions in Braille? I actually have a lot of questions about this that are almost entirely related to Snake that I've never thought about before now. There was one person, however, who didn't seem to be surprised in the least. The girl with the pink hair who had been leading him everywhere. I want to be Clover. You know, like a four-leaf clover. Good luck, right? Looking almost bored, she held out her left hand. The face of her bracelet showed the number four. Also, I find it very amusing that I think of what we've seen only Santa's was over cloth. They'd come around to Junpei. He held out his bracelet. All right, my number's five, so my code name is going to be Why Have One. Not like there's any point to it now. I mean, we all know your name already. You're Junpei. Oh. They all nodded. Akane stepped forward nervously. Then you should all call me by me my name, too. Well, she introduced herself as Akane, because, I mean, it doesn't seem... Doesn't seem fair to Jumpy. You're thinking it's not cool for you to hide your name after you told us is. She also... Didn't she tell us? You know, I can't remember already. Akane fidgeted awkwardly. Junpei decided he had to do something. What's your bracelet number? It's six. Okay, so Santa and Akane both have theirs over cloth. Which is weird. She hesitated for a moment, then held out her left hand. As she'd claimed, the bracelet's face showed a six. Junpei looked at it for a moment and thought, All right then, why don't we call you June? Yeah, you know, it's a six month a year. You're June. Junpei and June. 
Akane kneaded her hands and looked up at Junpei uncertain. He smiled back at her reassuringly. Are you good with that? She thought about it for a few more minutes and seemed to come to a decision and gave Junpei a small nod. I think that sentence would have actually worked better as moments rather than minutes. Uh, because with minutes it seems like she's just really indecisive. Their names decided, Junpei ran over them quickly in his head. One was Ace, two was Snake, three was Santa, four was Clover, five was Junpei, six is June, seven is I'd have already forgotten, eight was Lotus, and... Okay, that meant eight of them, including Junpei, had revealed their bracelet numbers. There was still one person left. Number nine. He was a man with glasses and hair like a bird's nest. He hadn't said anything since they'd met on the stairs. And he didn't look like the sort of person inclined to conversation. I keep hiccuping. This sucks. His skin was pale, his breath breathing was heavy, and he was soaked with nervous sweat. His behavior seemed very suspicious, or perhaps simply emotionally unstable. It was difficult to tell. Whatever the case, it was clear that he had only a fingertip's worth of grip on his sanity. The girl with pink hair, Clover, walked up to him slowly. She put her hands on her hips and eyed him suspiciously. What number are you? He didn't answer. His bloodshot eyes twitched from person to person and his breath came in hot pants. Hey! I'm talking to you. The man licked his dry lips with a shaking tongue and spoke with a voice like old paper. Isn't it obvious? There are nine people here, and you know who numbers one through eight are. I'm the only one left. So you're nine? Now nine is interesting, of course, because it doesn't do anything. Yeah. He extended a trembling arm. Why does it look like he has a letter jacket in that? The bracelet didn't he say nine. Clover looked at it contemptuously. What's your code name? Code name? What do you want us to call you? We all made up names. You should too. I don't need one. Why not? I'm not going to stay here. With you. He took a shuddering breath and exhaled. Clover looked at him something with something very like disgust. You've got some sort of plan? I do. What's that? You sure you want to know? Yeah? Alright. Let me show you. I'm going to do this. Also, when he stands up tall, he is, you know, taller than Clover, because I think, of course, everybody's taller than Clover, because uh, I have, I suspect that she's like 13 or something. Ah. Uh. By the time they realized what he was doing, it was too late to stop him. The man's body moved like a snake's. In the blink of an eye, he had slid around, slid around behind her and wrapped his arm around her waist. Hey, what the hell do you think you're doing? Silver, Santa, leapt forward, toward Clover and the Ninth Man. He was halfway there when... Stay back. Suddenly the man's hand dove into his pocket. It came back out with a knife. A pocket knife. He held it to Clover's pale, quivering neck. If you get any closer, I'll cut her open. Santa skidded to a halt. He snarled at the scrawny man with the knife and gritted his teeth. Yes, that's right. The man's smile was neither friendly nor reassuring. Wet poured down his neck, soaking the collar of his shirt. Clover, are you alright? The prince, Snake's voice, sounded oddly concerned. Well, gee... 
If she was the first person to know that he was blind, maybe he, he's concerned. Well, actually, he could just be empathetic. I don't see why that would, you know, him being concerned would be odd. Even if he has just met her. Yeah, I'm fine. Her voice shook, making her words even less convincing. What the hell are you trying to do? I told you. This is my plan. What are you going to do to her, you sick son of a bitch? Don't worry. I'm not going to do anything to her. If she just does what I tell her to, I'll let her go. He started to move backwards, slowly keeping his grip on Clover. Thankfully, this game doesn't get into territory that would be banned on Twitch. It might, actually. Keeping their distance, Junpei and the others followed. Eventually, the man reached the wall. He gave a start as his back touched it, then glanced around quickly and spoke. Verify. Huh? The left. Look on your left. Do you see the device on the wall? Place your hand on the scanner panel, the round part. What if I don't? The man's nostrils flared, and he looked like he was about to choke. Are you an idiot? What do you think? I could slit your throat right now. I'll kill you if I have to. All I need is your bracelet. Just do it. Do it now. Now that all I need is your bracelet part is actually kind of interesting. It does suggest that somebody could win all of this by just going around and killing everybody else. To a certain extent. He pressed the knife against Clover's neck, hard. Slowly, she stretched her left hand out toward the device. Her back was to it, and she had to feel around for a moment before she found the circular panel. It made a cold, electronic noise, and on the display above her hand, an asterisk appeared. So that's how it works, Junpei thought to himself. By placing one's palm on what the ninth man had called the scanner panel, the user's bracelet number would be entered into the device. Should you total the number on your numbered bracelets and find that the digital root of that is... Junpei shifted his eyes to the door itself. Had a bad cough there. The number on it was five. Obviously, he needed an uh, ace. The ninth man seemed to know a little more about the device's operation than he should. How had he known exactly what to do? Good, good, you're done. Next. His bloodshot eyes crept from person to person until finally... They stopped on the line. Ace. You, right? You're the one with the number one bracelet, right? Yes, I am. So? Then you're next. Just verify your number like this little brat did. What are you doing? Do it. Don't you care what happens to her? Okay, okay. Just calm down. He's held up his hands, palms out. The ninth man jerked his chin toward the device. Which... Thinking about the actions here, jerking your chin's kind of an awkward motion. I mean, I would probably write that as jerking his temple toward the device, but I mean, that's, that's an equally odd description. Slowly, cautiously, Ace moved toward the device, and the ends is kind of one of the spots where I, I get overly analytical about minor bullshit uh, writing. Uh, slowly, cautiously, Ace moved toward the device. After what seemed like an agonizing eternity, he reached it. Now verify. Ace nodded and placed his hand on the scanner panel. The device beeped again and a second asterisk appeared. Now the device had Clover and Ace's numbers. Four and one. Four plus one equals five. Same as the number written on the door, but it wouldn't open just yet. It needed three. Only three to five can pass. Eh, yeah. The door needed at least one more person. Who would that be? Himself, Junpei. Stop being dumb. 
get back. His voice shook, but the knife he held to Clover's throat made his words a command. Ace took two and three steps back. No, farther. More than that, go all the way back. Slowly, Ace did what he was told. The ninth man's lips curled into a cruel, twisted smile, and I missed what that said. That was when Junpei understood his plan. Clover's four and Ace's one, added to the ninth man's nine, four plus one plus nine equals fourteen, one plus four equals five. Nine doesn't do anything. In other words, <laughs> thank God you were all so cooperative. Now I can get out of this nightmare. He pressed his own hand against the scanner panel. A third asterisk appeared on the screen. He dropped his hand to the lever on the side of the device and pulled. The door opened with a heavy, metallic groan. He let go of Clover. Wait. Junpei leapt towards the ninth man, but he wasn't fast enough. The man shoved Clover. Ah! And hopped through the door. Yeah, that is a really weird jacket. It's like a vest over a letter jacket. Okay, have a good one, guys. I'm going off ahead now. Well then, goodbye. He raised his hand and waved, a twisted smirk on his face. Then he was gone. The door ground shut with a dull clang of metal on metal. Clover, are you alright? Snake ran to Clover's side as she lay on the floor. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine. She climbed unsteadily to her feet and once there leaned heavily on Snake's shoulder for support. Junpei ran to the door. The others followed him. Several pairs of hand grabbed hold of the handles and pulled. They grunted and strained, but fuck all happened. Shit, it won't budge. That was when Lotus the dancer spoke. Her voice was quiet. Do you hear something? Like what? Like some sort of beeping. Junpei pressed his ear against the cold metal of the door. The others did the same. You're right. I can hear it too. What is it? Then they heard something else. It was the ninth man. Shit. Why isn't it stopping? God damn it. Y you lied. Lied? This wasn't supposed to happen. This is wrong. This is wrong. His voice shook with fear. Safe on the outside, they stepped back from the door and looked at one another. What's happening in there? Open the door. Please. I'm begging you. Help me. Please get me out of here. Get me out of here. Junpei grabbed hold of the device. He slammed his hand on the scanner panel. Nothing happened. Why didn't it register him? He looked at the display where the asterisk had shown up. It said engaged where it had prior set up vacant. Oh my god. Oh my god. There's no time left. Listen. I was lied to. He lied to me. He put me in here. It was him. He killed me. It was him. This doesn't help who. Ah, yeah. The explosion rocked the room. Instinctively, they ducked, then stood up slowly when they realized there was no danger. No one spoke. Silence filled the room. In that silence, the electronic tone that echoed across the room sounded as loud as a gunshot. All eyes turned toward it. It had come from the device mounted next to the door. The display changed from engaged 
to vacant. Let's see if we can open it. Seven, the mountain, swallowed hard. Junpei nodded and placed his hand on the scanner panel. A red asterisk appeared on the LCD panel. The device had registered Junpei's bracelet number, five. His was not enough, however. At least two more people were needed. Junpei asked, which pair? I mean, really, any of them would work? We're not actually going through. Ace Lotus, you think you could give me a hand here? The pun was a little too on the nose, but the mood was still grim. Both Ace and Lotus lifted their ha left hands silently. He verified and she followed suit. 5 plus 1 plus 8 equals 14, 1 plus 4 is 5. Yada yada, they'd filled the conditions. If they were to pull the lever on the side, it would open. Are you guys ready? I'm going to open it. Junpei grabbed the lever and looked back over his shoulder. They stiffened and nodded. Junpei nodded back and set his mouth in a grim line. Then he slowly lowered the lever. You could at least have another animation for slowly doing it. There was a metallic groan and the door slid open. A breath of air drifted out of it, carrying a stench that nearly made them gag. Junpei grimaced and put a hand over his mouth. Oh my god. Good god. Lotus and Ace shuddered. Seven grunted. Whoa, that's pretty bad. Even Santa's voice shook. He, he blew up. It appeared that Santa was right. The hallway on the other side of the door was splattered with chunks of torn flesh and dark red blood. The shriek echoed across the room. It had come from June. Then her strength left her, and she dropped. As Junpei turned to catch her, the door grown shut. And since we have seen from them establishing the stakes with this, if you don't walk through, your bracelet doesn't blow you up. June, you okay? Junpei dropped to his knees and put his arm around her shoulders. That was when he noticed her whole body was feverish. She was radiating intense heat. What the hell? Where'd this fever come from? June didn't answer. Her face looked like wax, and her whole body began to shake. Alright, let's just rest for a minute, okay? You think you can walk? He nodded weakly. Junpei lifted June to her feet and guided her to a nearby chair. Despite the fact that we haven't seen a chairs in you know, actually modeled since we left that room. Here we go. As gently as he could, he set her down in it. How are you feeling? Are you alright? She nodded, and as she did, a single huge tear rolled down the side of her face. Why? Why did this happen? Her voice cracked, broken by misery and grief and choked by sobs. Why did this happen? Junpei spun around. Do any of you know what the fuck is going on here? Also, I think one of the reasons that I probably have good memories of this is... This is one of the first games I remember actually using fuck. Who's Zero? What's this nonary game? Come on, anybody? Anything? What the hell is going on? What are we doing here? No one spoke. Ace, Snake, Santa, Clover, Seven, and Lotus. They simply stood there. Seven pairs of downcast eyes and seven grim lines for mouths. It's... Uh, yeah. We don't know for certain Snake's eyes are downcast. June's body shook with silent sobs. They slowed as the minutes tick b ticked by, and eventually they stopped. The 
Then suddenly, in the cold, heavy silence that had enveloped them like a thick fog, a bell began to ring. The clock in the central hall. Seven, eight, nine, ten times. And then, on the tenth ring, it stopped. The sound of the bell faded away into silence. It's ten o'clock, then. He said what each one of them had been thinking. That means it's been an hour since Zero's little announcement. Seven's deep voice echoed across the room. Fuck. I've had enough of this crap. Santa leapt to his feet, his fists clenched. How lo- Excuse me. How long are we going to pussyfoot around like this? We've only got eight hours until this time limit Zero was going on about is up. Let's get going already. Go. Go. Santa's outburst fell on deaf ears. No one seemed to agree with him. Not when, you know, the last person they saw go through those doors, they also saw the aftermath of them going through the doors. They stared back at him, their eyes blank and their faces tired. Finally, Lotus spoke. No, I refuse. I'm not going to end up like him. Him? You mean the ninth man? Of course. Who else? In his mind's eye, Junpei saw the corpse again. The dark, reddish-black pool of blood. Wait, black? That normally implies dried blood. The scattered pieces of flesh. Organs strewn across the floor, like the blossoming of a grotesque flower. The explosion that had torn through his body had been powerful. The ninth man's neck had been twisted at an odd angle. Junpei suspected the detonation had thrown, against him, thrown him against the wall. Half of his face was crushed and the other half was covered in blood. Most of his abdomen had been emptied, either by the explosion or by gravity. Also, how is this being done by a explosion from the wrist? A, well, actually, I guess most explosives are probably that powerful. He had landed on his back, and stark white ribs jutted up out of his chest like the legs of some macabre crab. Junpei felt something flip in his stomach. I think he just screwed up. Eyebrows went up, and Santa continued. He probably set off some sort of trap, and that killed him. I'm not going to screw up like that. I'm getting out of here alive. <laughs> Whatever Snake was laughing at, Santa did not find particularly humorous. What's so goddamn funny? Oh, my apologies, you were just so very confident. I couldn't help myself. What the fuck? I think you've mistaken the situation. Huh? The ninth man's death. It had nothing to do with the trap, or at least not the sort of tra trap you imagine it did. Then, he broke one of Zero's rules. That was why he died. Quite simple, if you think about it. You still don't. Alright. How about you take a moment and think back to what Z Zero said. Specifically, what did he say about the number of people? He said only three to five people can pass through one numbered door. And after that, you've forgotten the relevant part. What did Zero say? Santa furrowed his brow in thought. Junpei thought back. Zero said that everyone who had verified had to go. I don't know why those other two options are there. <laughs> Oh, I keep hitting B. All who enter must leave, and all who enter must contribute. Right? I think it was something like that. Whatever it was, it means groups of less than three or more than five can't go through. That is correct. A gold star for you, Junpei. So now we are also in elementary school. Snake inclined his head towards Junpei. The ninth man, however, broke that rule. 
Also, I am very quickly discovering why uh, a lot of the voice actors sit there and say you are, you need to be drinking water constantly. Because I've gone through like... I need to think this one out for a second. Uh, 600 milliliters of water so far? And I also had another beverage that was 300 milliliters. So I've had almost a liter of water while doing the stream. He tried to pass through a numbered door by himself. That's why he was executed. And Zero's watching us from somewhere, making sure we don't break any rules. Oh, I'm not so sure of that. Why not? Because this execution system is entirely automatic. You didn't notice? There's no need for him to monitor us. What do you mean? Snake looked at Seven with what could only be described as pity and sighed. Very well. I see it must be me who tells you. We waited long enough, I suppose. I'd hoped Zero might spare me the trouble, but that seems increasingly unlikely. He couldn't see them, of course, but perhaps Snake sensed the confused eyes upon him. When Ace spoke, he gave words to everyone else's thoughts. Oh, do you know something? Well, I know a great many things, but yes. What is it you know? Here. Snake removed a card from the pocket of his jacket. With a flourish, he presented it to Ace, who took a close look at it and spoke. Come on now, what's the point of giving me this? Give me that. <clears throat> Santa snatched the card from Ace, and his expression of disgust quickly turned to one of confusion. Huh? The hell is this? Seven tugged it out of Santa's hands. Eh, I see. The card went from Seven to Lotus, from Lotus to June, and finally to Junpei. It's Braille. He looked at it and understood. This is Braille. Braille, the written language of the blind. The card was covered with small, embossed bumps. Junpei could recognize it, but he certainly couldn't read it. Also, I think my being an ass here for a moment, my favorite implementation of Braille is definitely when it has the color formed for it, but doesn't actually have the bumps because somebody fucked up in making it. Sorry, guys, I can't read this. The blind man probably can, though. Junpei handed the card back to Snake, who nodded at him with a small smirk. Okay, that was fun. What's so important about that card? I found it in my pocket. I can only assume it's a message from Zero. From Zero? A message? What does it say? Metal Gear. Suddenly everybody was crowding around Snake, desperate to hear what the message said. Santa especially looked as if he were about to grab hold of Snake and shake the answers from him. Snake raised his hand. Calm down now. No need to panic. Don't need to force me. I will read it. Junpei swallowed hard and waited for him to start. He was not the only one. Presently, Snake began to read, his voice calm. His fingers glided over the tiny bumps as he spoke. Bracelet number two. Since you are not blessed with sight, I shall bless you, and only you, with information. I shall tell you of the function of the red, of the dead, and of the bracelet. The red is the recognition device. It will verify your number. Beside every numbered door, you will find a red. The dead is the deactivation device. It does exactly what it says. Once you have passed through the numbered door, you must use the dead to stop the detonator in your bracelet. But perhaps you are wondering, what does this detonator detonate? I am afraid that this may be something of a surprise. I have placed a small bomb inside of you and the people whom you are about to meet. You swallowed it while you were unconscious. Okay, that explains why the bomb blew the ninth man to smithereens. I have no doubt that by the time you read this note, the bomb will have passed your stomach and found its way to your small intestine. In other words, you will be unable to regurgitate it. I suggest you do not try. That's actually a good suggestion. Regurgitation would probably induce additional acid in your stomach. And that additional acid may be sufficient to set the bomb off by itself. Uh, as I've mentioned before, the bracelet on your left hand contains a detonator. 
Think of it as a remote fuse or timer for the bomb in your body. There's only one condition which will cause it to detonate. That condition is that you enter a numbered door. Once you have done so, the timer will activate no matter who you may be. You will have 81 seconds. If after the at time the detonator has not been deactivated, it will send a signal to the bomb in your body instructing it to explode. In order to deactivate the detonator, every person who verified their number at the red must also vi verify their numbers at the dead. Once all numbers have been verified by the dead, you need only pull the lever at its side and the countdown will cease. Anyone who does not verify their number at the red will find themselves unable to verify their number at the dead. That is to say, if you should pass through a numbered door without first verifying your number at the red, in 81 seconds, you will be dead. You must also keep in mind that the numbers doors will close automatically after 9 seconds has passed. So long as the door is open, the dead will not function. You would do well to remember this. Lastly, let us discuss how to remove the bracelets. There are only two ways to do so. One, you escape from the ship. Two, your heart rate reaches zero. In other words, once the bracelet is taken outside the confines of the ship or detects that its wearer's heartbeat has fallen to zero, it will shut down automatically. There is no other way to remove your bracelet. If you attempt to force it off or disable the detonator, the bomb within you will immediately explode. This is all the information which I can impart to you. How you choose to use it is for you to decide. If used wisely, you can eliminate those who might be a danger to you. For a time, you would be able to control your fate. I wish you the best of luck. Snake finished reading and carefully returned the card to his pocket. The message had been lengthy, but its meaning was clear. Only those who verified their numbers at the red could pass through the numbers' doors. Teams could not increase or decrease their numbers. The reds, deads, and bracelets enforced the rules. They were judge, jury, and executioner. In defiance of Zero's suggestion, both Santa and Seven put fingers down their throats and began to gag. The rest stiffened. Some touched their stomach, some simply stared at their bracelets. Junpei gingerly touched his stomach. There was a bomb inside his body. The thought of it made him queasy. His stomach felt oddly hollow, and his legs were weak. Why had Zero designed such a ludicrous game? Junpei looked over at the others. All right, I'm going to ask one more time. Do any of you know anything about Zero? They were all silent, each person waiting to hear what the others would say. Finally, Santa spoke. Actually, I, I saw him. I saw Zero when I got grabbed. I didn't see his face, though. Son of a bitch was wearing some kind of gas mask. What the hell? Come on, guys, give me something. You know, like, surprise or something? Instead, it was Santa who looked surprised. There was a moment of silence, and then everyone spoke at once. Yeah, I saw him too. Me too. He was wearing a gas mask. The stories were sorted out. The truth became clear. All of their stories were the same. They had been abducted at home at midnight. The person claiming to be Zero had worn a mask. There had been white smoke, and each person had passed out. When they awoke, they had found themselves on D-Deck, in a room with a three-level bunk bed. Only seven stories seemed to lack the detail of others. Oh, me? Yeah, well, mine was just like the rest of yours. That was all he had said. It occurred to Junpei at the time that it sounded somewhat strange, but he didn't press the issue. He hadn't done so, because there was something that struck him as even stranger. That was the mystery of the relationship between Snake and Clover. For some reason, they had been abduct abducted from the same room and woken up in the same room. Junpei looked at them thoughtfully. What's the deal with the two of you, anyway? It was Clover that answered. Clearly she felt she had nothing to hide. We're siblings. Siblings? Uh, yeah. Makes my brother older brother, obviously. That means I'm his little sister. That really so hard to understand? Junpei was taken aback. The others seemed just as surprised. She is correct, of course. He laid his hand on Clover's shoulder. Are you surprised? Well, yeah, but... Why? 
There are other people here with connections to one another. Those two, for instance. Snake pointed to Junpei and June. Oh, you mean between Jumpy and me? Ah, yes. You did say you were childhood friends, didn't you? You went to school together? Yeah. Jun glanced at Junpei, uncomfortable with the sudden attention. Junpei felt somewhat nervous as well and tried to scratch his head as casually as possible. Hey, you think maybe we could figure out who Zero is this way? Yeah, you're right. You connect the dots between the victims and that leads you to the perp. Textbook, uh, stuff. Junpei, Jun, does any of this ring a bell? Ring a bell? Ring a bell? They looked at one another, and like it was staged, they both tilted their neck at the same time. Well, perhaps you went to school with the son of a multimillionaire. A millionaire? Son? Well, someone brought, bought this boat and set up all of this. Whoever Zero is, they must be incredibly rich. Well, we can't be sure of that. To me, this seems as though it's the work of an organization, not an individual. Zero is most likely simply the rep representative of a larger group. What sort of organization? It could be a number of things, an army perhaps, or a research group. Perhaps this is all some sort of psychological experiment. If it is, then it's a pretty fucked up experiment. I hate that I'm agreeing with Santa more and more, given that I hate his name. I mean, come on, a guy's dead. The word dead hung in the air, heavy and ominous. The room went quiet again. I don't know who the hell this zero asshole is, but I know for sure he's going to be pretty fucked up in the head to do all this. This was all one guy, and he's got some serious issues. Even with the specter of death hanging over them, their discussions continued for some time. In the end, however, they learned nothing. By the time they finished, one and a half of their nine hours were gone. All they had to show for it was impatience. Man, look, we only got seven and a half hours left, right? You really sure you want to just sit around? No one was willing to argue this time. Very well, then. There's only one way for us to proceed. Sure not going to be fun running around knowing we got to jump when Zero says jump. Well, it's stupid to just sit around here doing nothing. Thanks to Snake's card, at least we have some idea of how all this works. Correct. And so long as we follow the rules, we should, uh, we'll, we will most likely be alright. But, but what? Who's going to go in which door? June looked toward the numbered doors. Oh yeah, that's right. We can't have any more than five people in one door. All eight of us can't go in the same door. Then it will seem we would have to split up. Wait. Lotus looked terrified. I'm telling you now, there is no way in hell that I'm going into door five. Come now, don't be selfish. Call me whatever the hell you want. I'm not going in there. If I'm going to have to walk through all that blood, then I'd rather stay here. <sighs> and we were doing so well. He shook his head sadly. Sorry, but I ain't going in there either. Someone else can go into door five. Oh, Santa, not you too. Hey man, I just bought these shoes. Yeah, thank you, Santa, for, for unredeeming yourself. If you think I'm getting some creepy dude's blood all over him, you got another thing coming. Another think coming? That was the last straw. What the hell, man? Weren't you the one who kept saying we should get going? Yeah? So? Doesn't mean I wanted to go into door five. Oh, God. There was an awkward silence. Finally, Seven spoke. Fine, I'll go into door five. I can't go in there alone, though. Anyone else willing to come with me? There was another long silence. This time Snake was the one to break it. I'll go. What? Don't worry, you'll be fine. We may part now, but I'm certain we'll meet again later. How do you know that? Because I do. That's not an answer. If you're going, I'm going too. I'm going into door five. What am I going to do with you? There's nothing you have to do. A step forward. If I join you, the problem is solved, correct? Seven is seven, and snake is two. And if you add clovers four and my one, the digital root will be five. Seven plus two plus four plus one equals fourteen. One plus four is five. Oh, it works perfectly. Four of us can go into door five. 
Wait. What about the other four? What's their digital root going to be? Junpei did a quick mental calculation. Lotus, Santa, June, and Junpei remained. Their bracelet numbers were 8, 3, 6, and 5. 8, 3, 6, 5. What would the digital root be? Thankfully, you don't actually even have to do the math because, well, it's pretty obvious. Add up our four bracelet numbers and the digital root is four. Then we can go into di root door four. Yeah, huh, that worked out well. Junpei ran over the team assignments in his head one more time. Four people would go into door five, seven snake, clover, and ace. Four people would go into door four. Lotus, Santa, June, and Junpei. Junpei had to ask himself if the teams were what he really wanted. Beyond door 5 was what remained of the ninth man. He never wanted to see that thing again. But something in him said it would be unwise not to examine the corpse even a little closer. Of course, if he went through door 5, he wouldn't be going with Lotus and Santa. True, it would be possible for him to bring June with him through door 5, but that, meant that, she, that would mean that she would have to see the horrific carnage that waited there. Junpei didn't want that. Junpei was torn. Should he stay silent and go through door 4? Or should he stop them all and insist on door 5? As he turned his option over and over in his mind, he spoke up. Alright then. It seems we've reached a conclusion. Shall we go? He began to walk towards door 5. Clover and Snake followed, with Seven a short distance behind them. Junpei, which door do you want to go through? And this is one of the actual first... I should probably bring up the actual thing. Um, first checks in the game. There are a handful of checks here. Um, basically... There are going to be, I think it's four actual uh, checks later on. And first time I did all of them. First time I went through the game, I did all of those. Now, I had no idea what the requirement was to get the actual real ending. I just kind of lucked into fulfilling all of the checks. But of course, that wasn't the real ending. Having said that, if I had not gotten that ending, and I should probably be saying the, be waiting for the, uh, the, the dialogue here. If I had not gotten the cliffhanger ending, I don't know that I'd have bothered with going to get the real ending. Because the other endings kind of suck. Why had Junpei even considered doing otherwise? He would be there for Jun? For Akane Kirishiki? That seemed good. He felt it was the right choice to make. He made no shows of affection, but Junpei saw her as something more than just a friend from his childhood. He watched the other four walk toward their door. East Snake, Clover, and Seven. Junpei said nothing as they left. Before long, they had reached door five. They talked to one another for a few seconds saying things Junpei couldn't hear, and they laid their hands one by one on the scanner panel of the red. He grabbed the lever, his face tight, excuse me, his face tight with determination. He turned over his shoulder to look at Junpei and his companions. Goodbye. Be careful. As Ace pulled the lever, the door swung open, the mouth of a great, hungry beast. Beyond the door, Junpei knew, lay the sad remains of the ninth man. It did not surprise him that Ace, Clover, and Seven hesitated. The body was not a pleasant thing. Snake had no such problems, as his blindness made him immune to the horror. He stepped through the door, his feet making a wet splack in the pool of blood. Do you intend to kill me? 
I assume you haven't forgotten the door remains only remains open for nine seconds, have you? Snake had not even bothered to turn around, but the other three stepped through themselves, steeled themselves, and stepped through the door. Door 5 swung shut, closing with the heavy finality of metal upon metal. Junpei and his companions scrambled to the door. They pressed their ears to it in an attempt to hear what might be taking place on the other side. It's beeping. It's just like before. Probably the sound of the detonator on that bracelet. You think they're okay? June's face showed her concern more plainly than her words could ever could. Almost as though in response to her question, a voice rang out from the other side of the door. It was Seven. Hey, there it is. That's gotta be that dead thing. Come on, get over here. We gotta authenticate. The beeping stopped. The sighs of relief were audible even through the heavy door. Ooh, looks like it stopped. Junpei and his companions leaned away from the door and breathed a collective sigh of relief of their own. Hey guys, are you doing all right over there? They'd heard Seven's voice, but it wouldn't be wouldn't hurt to be sure. Yep, we're fine. Despite the recent danger, Clover's voice was as bubbly as ever. Oh, hey, I'm gonna tell you about this whole dead thing, okay? The de the dead is just like the red, but the color's different. You know how the dead how the red was red? Well, the dead is blue. Other than that, it's just like the red. Authenticating is the same, too. Awesome, thanks, that helps a lot. Well, we should probably move on now. And something interesting to note is it showed the red there is still engaged. I don't know if that's actually a story element or not. I, I genuinely can't remember. Junpei and the others left door 5 and headed towards door 4. They stood in front of the red, placed each of their hands upon it. Four asterisks appeared on the screen. Junpei grabbed the lever and turned around. You guys ready? Yeah, sure. Let's go. None of them looked particularly optimistic, but their faces were set. Junpei nodded to them and turned back towards the red. All right, let's go. With strength and determination, he pulled the lever. Run. The four of them leapt through the door together. The moment they had passed through it, each heard a cold electronic sound coming from their left wrist. In the center of each bracelet, a red skull appeared and began to flash. The detonator's countdown had begun. And no, if we sit here, it doesn't just blow up. In the long moment th that each of them spent staring at their wrists. That was nine seconds, guys. You wasted nine seconds. The numbered door behind them closed, the sound of metal on metal reverberating down the hallway. There was no way back now. They were committed. If they could not find the device to deactivate their detonators. Hey, where the hell is the dead? How would I know? Don't give me that crap. Start looking. I already am. They began to run, eyes looking frantically for the device that was the key to their salvation. The hallway they found themselves running down was a long one, easily 300 feet in length. On the right side of it stood a series of wooden doors, all nearly identical. They had taken time to think. They would likely have discerned that the doors led to cabins. Don't tell me that the dead is in one of those rooms. Oh no. How many rooms do you think there are? Junpei was too frightened to count properly, but at his best guess, there were seven or eight of them. Ah, oh, fuck. There wasn't time to count them, to be sure. Junpei ran to the nearest door. He grabbed the knob and shook it hard. It wouldn't open. It didn't feel locked. More like somebody had it hammered an iron plate over the other side of the door. Junpei turned around to find another door and saw that his companions had already run to doors of their own. They did not seem to be having any more success than he had. Her own words confirmed his fears. Shit, this one's no good. Same here. It's not moving. June was the last to speak up. As Junpei looked in her direction, his eye caught something he hadn't noticed before. A small, 
red light. It flashes him dimly from the end of the hallway. That's it, over there. Even as he yelled, he ran. He grabbed Santa, Lotus, and June and pulled them toward the light. Santa called out to them as he ran. Hey, how many more seconds do we have? How would I know? Our time limit is 81 seconds. I know that, goddammit. I'm asking you how many seconds we have left. In all likelihood, Junpei figured, nearly a minute had already passed since the door had closed behind them. If that was true, urgency foremost in all of their minds, they arrived at the end of the hallway. The dead set on, sat on the left wall, blinking almost tauntingly at them. Junpei grabbed a hold of his of the machine, his hands slick with sweat and shaking. He slammed his hand against the scanner panel. The other three quickly followed suit. With a grunt, Santa yanked the lever down. Ooh, looks like it stopped. His hands beginning to steady, Junpei wiped away some of the sweat that had beaded on his forehead. As they caught their breath, the four companions began to look around. At the end of the hallway lay a heavy-looking set of double doors. But in the walls of the hallway on either side of the larger door were two smaller ones. They all needed inspecting, but Junpei began with the largest of the three, the double doors. How many times had he come across similar doors with similar results, he wondered. Or perhaps, he corrected himself, more a lack of results. Whatever the reason, the door remained firm and unyielding and refused to allow Junpei, or anyone else, passage. Near the handle was a small keyhole. Above the keyhole was a small symbol engraved in the brass. Mail. He wasn't quite sure what to make of it, and stared at it for a moment in confusion. It was June that corrected him. No, that's not the symbol for mail. That's probably the symbol of Mars. Well, technically they're the same symbol. But I saw a number of similar symbols near the main stairway. Symbols of the solar system. The sun. Saturn. Earth. And now Mars. At least that's what I'm assuming. So this isn't the man symbol, it's a symbol for Mars? I think so, yes. While Junpei and Jun talked, Santa had disappeared. They turned to find him some distance down the hallway. He'd gone to check the other doors. Eventually he reached the last of them and jogged back. It took him only a moment to catch his breath again. Here's the deal. None of the other doors open. And that must mean... We only have two more doors. Lotus examined the doors on either side of the larger double door. Each one had a metal plate attached to it. Junpei figured they were probably room numbers. The door on the left read B92, and the door on the right proclaimed that it led to B93. Alright, let's open them. Yeah. Junpei put his hand on the doorknob for the door that said room 92. Santa moved to the door. Moved to the... No, that's that's just bad English. That's That's not me being confused by something decent. And it's it's not that it's it's bad writing, it's that it's English sucks at times. <clears throat> so Santa moved to the door to room ninety three is correct. But it also sucks. Santa moved to the door that led to room ninety three. It made it through the numbered door alive. There was nothing more to be afraid of. Junpei and Santa looked at each other and nodded. One, two, three. In unison, they pushed against their respective doors and promptly found themselves in a new room. Junpei followed, Jun followed Junpei as he threw open his door. They turned around and saw that the door on the other side was open as well. Through the door was another person, his mouth agape. It was Santa. Hey, uh, it opened. Yeah, it did. Junpei and Santa looked at each other. They had not expected the doors to yield so easily. Lotus's calm voice broke into their thoughts. Maybe this is all part of Zero's plan. I can't say I enjoyed being treated like someone's puppet. As she headed for room 93, Lotus continued. Well, now we have these two rooms. I'm sure there's something in there that will help us get out of here. 
Let's find it. Santa and I will search this room. Junpei and Jun, Jun search the other one. All right. Okay. And we have our second Seek a Way Out. In this case, the first thing we are going to do is save. And I'm going to go grab a bit more water. I did not intend to nearly mute the, uh, the actual music there, though. Okay. So, now we need to investigate here. Oh, it's the dog thing. Where the hell are you looking, June? Looks kind of like a demon with an elephant-like nose, sucking on a human being's brain. What the fuck is wrong with you, June? Where the hell did that come from? What's her brain made of? Can't say I'd find mind finding out a little more about what goes on in there. It's a kind of weird looking picture. It's some sort of weird black and white design. It looks like there's a room on the right side of this picture. Yep, there's a little door. There's a little blue platform protruding from the shower wall next to the knobs. It's for putting soap on. I used shower once, so I know. That's the bathroom wall. There are square tiles all over it. I don't know, I just love the, the confidence that Junpei has when he says, I've used a shower once. I know. There's a shower head. There's nothing special about it. The knobs shower knob. Let's see if anything happens when we turn it. No water's coming out. Jumpy, do you think there might be something on the shower curtain? Hmm? Well, maybe. You want to try closing it? Nope. There doesn't seem to be anything here. Yeah, you're right. Let's put it back. Shower curtains, huh? Let's try closing it. Yep. In all its waterproof glory. There's nothing. Suspicious. Just a normal old shower curtain. How is that suspicious? A narrow shower and I'm standing in it with June. This is awkward. Time to open the curtain. Uh, yeah, why don't we go back to the living room? Okay, let's go back. I don't think there's anything else there. That vase looks expensive. I wonder how much we could get for it. Are you going to steal it? <laughs> she was definitely going to steal it. Can we check out that little... Oh, no. I guess we can't really check out that little bottle. Odd. Jumpy, what are you doing? We don't have the time to be relaxing on a sofa. It's a display case. But there's nothing being displayed. How sad. 
Looks like the drawers are empty too. Akane is just rifling through everything to steal. A box of matches. Hey, what, if, what if we want to open up the damn matches? Junpei looked down blankly at what he was holding, then up at June. Oh yeah, how's your fever? You feeling better now? Yes, I'm feeling fine. June certainly looked fine. Junpei held his hand on her forehead for a few seconds. It seemed her fever really had gone down. Are you worried about me? I don't think this one actually matters. And I don't mean that in the, you know... I, I really don't think this one matters at all. June blushed and giggled. By the way, Jumpy, how did you end up here? What do you mean? I told you early, didn't I? There was a man with a gas mask when you got home at night. You inhaled some white smoke and passed out. When you woke up, you were on D-deck. Yeah, that's it. But is that really the truth? What? Jumpy, are you hiding something from me? No. Why would I? Well, if you think about it, this is awfully suspicious. I mean, why would two childhood friends bump into each other on a place like this? Hey, I could ask you the same thing. Are you hiding something? What would I hide? Well, I don't know. Anything. I mean, you're hiding. How would I know? You mean, like, the number of men I've dated? Junpei's heart stumbled over itself. Do you want to know? He had to admit he was a little curious. But don't worry. He smiled at him. Only 18. I'm zero. Yeah, I guess I just haven't met Mr. Right yet. That's... It's dating. June looked a little embarrassed and scratched the back of her head in a desperate attempt to seem nonchalant. Yeah, this this definitely seems like high schoolers. Junpei coughed quietly in much the same way. Anyway, I'm not hiding anything. Just like you, Jumpy. When I woke up, I was on D-deck. Well, you do have a point. I mean, why did Zero pick us? We haven't seen each other since elementary school. June nodded, and for a few moments she had the faraway look of someone in deep thought. Look for what connects the victims. That's That will lead you to the culprit. Do you remember Seven saying something like that? Yeah, I do. So? Well, that's what I'm saying. I think this must all have something to do with a classmate of ours. You got any ideas who it might be? No, nothing. Oh. Well, if it had something to do with school, then it could be one of our teachers, or maybe the principal. Or the janitor, or the lunch lady. No, I can barely remember any of them. Yeah, I know. Junpei went back to searching, feeling unpleasant and confused. Elementary school. Elementary school. Was there anything strange that had happened in elementary school? As he searched the room, he continued to rack his brain. Also, apparently, when I put my mic back, did not tighten it up enough. As it just went completely vertical. And a bed. And a water jug. This is a bedroom. They probably have it here because your throat always feels dry when you wake up. You know? My throat's dry, but I think that's a little because I'm a little nervous right now. Well, we did run a lot, so we're kind of sweaty. Hey, Jumpy, did you want to take a shower together? Whoa. Just kidding. Too late to take it back. My brain's already working out the picture. My throat was dry already. This sure isn't helping. And if I had remembered, you know, some of these things, I wouldn't have bothered... This isn't painting, is it a map? It looks like a map of the ship's interior. Oh, this is a great find. I think it'll be really useful. Let's take it with us. It's now possible to use the map screen. Map screen. Ah, touch the down menu. If you touch X while in the menu, you'll also be taken to the map screen. Junbei took one last look at the map, then folded it up and slid it back into his pocket. June looked up as he closed it. The ship is bigger than I thought. Yeah, it's probably about 900 feet long. 
Must be one of those fancy cruise ships. Of course, it doesn't really look like a cruise ship. Everything in here is really retro. Even if it's some sort of style choice, there's just too much. Remember what Zero said? On April 14th, 1912, the famous ocean liner Titanic crashed into an iceberg. After remaining afloat for two hours and 40 minutes, it sank beneath the waters of the North Atlantic. You think maybe this boat and the Titanic have something to do with each other? Hmm, that's a good point. I doubt he would have mentioned it if there wasn't a reason. Junpei took a moment to look around the room. You think this boat is... A replica of the Titanic? A replica? Yeah. You know, like a copy of the actual boat. Who on earth would make something like that? Well, isn't... Isn't a replica of the Titanic supposed to be launching next year? Not in-game or anything, in real life. Or is it, it might be 2022 or some bullshit like that. Crazy Titanic fans. No way. Do you even know how much money that would take? No idea. But all they've got to do is break even, you know? Break even? Yeah. They could use it as a cruise ship. Climb aboard a piece of history. Sail around the world in the resurrected Titanic. Hell, with marking like that, they'd probably have more customers than they'd know what to do with. You really think people would want to ride on a ship with such an ominous past? It's the site of the worst accident in history. I... I don't even know that it's necessarily the worst nautical accident in history. Over 1,500 people died. I wouldn't be surprised if you'd get cursed just for going. A curse, huh? Jumpy, do you believe in that sort of thing? You know, curses and stuff. No, they're a load of crap. Sorry, but I can't really say I believe in that kind of stuff. Tact was not, not one of Junpei's many better qualities. <laughs> oh, that's good. What about you? Nah, I guess that's kind of a dumb question. Yes, I do believe in curses. In fact, I think it was a curse that sunk the Titanic. What? A curse sunk the Titanic. The curse of the Egyptian mummy. Junpei couldn't understand how June had managed a straight face to say that. I can't even, I can barely read it with a straight face, so, yeah. Supposedly, the Titanic carried the mummy of the priestess Amon-Ra, which was stolen from a pyramid. And they say that the mummy had a history. Everyone involved with it died mysterious deaths. Come on, I'm sure you've heard of it before. Those who open the coffin will be forever cursed. Haven't you ever heard that one? So you're saying the Titanic sunk because of that curse. That's right. June's eyes had lit up with excitement, like a child with a new toy. Hmm, that's stupid. I don't buy it. It's true. How can you be so sure that mummy wasn't just a normal mummy? It was really mysterious, totally unbelievable. What is so unbelievable about it? Well, supposedly, she was really pretty. Pretty. Yes. But she was a mummy. That's right. She wasn't all shriveled up or rotten or anything. She looked just like she was alive. Oh, I get it. It's that thing, I don't remember the name, where your body turns into some kind of wa wax. Saporification. I think. Saponification? I think it's saponification. If a dead body is put in the right sort of environment, the fat in it turns into something kind of like candle wax, right? And... Yes. No, it's a pontification. Yes. That's not what it was. Huh? That's not it. She wasn't wax. Then what is it? They say that she was frozen. What? Frozen. In the middle of Egypt. That's right. The whole body was frozen solid. You know how a human body is more than 60% water? Well, all of that water was frozen. The story says that from the time of its discovery all the way through to when it got put on the Titanic, and even though it was carried through the desert, her body never melted. June and Junpei talked a little more, and then went back to their investigation. But even as they did, his mind went back to what she'd told him. Ice that wouldn't melt, even in the desert. Could such a thing really exist? No, even if it did, it wouldn't really be ice anymore, would it? The more he thought about it, the more his head hurt, like he'd eaten his ice cream too fast.
You ready for more awkward lines with Junpei? In June? It's a light blue blanket with some designs on it. Someone's made the bed or at least never unmade it. There's only bed sheets under the blanket. Nothing exciting. Oh. Look, there's two pillows right next to each other. Guess it's a double. Oh, what's up? You're turning red. Oh man, is her fever back? Hey, are you alright? Do you need to lay down for a minute? I'm fine. I think it's still a little early for that. Huh? Hey, seriously, are you really okay? Well, I mean, I guess if they're focusing on the drawer, that's going to be the important part of the uh, vanity here. Hey, we don't have time for that. Come on, it's not like there's anyone here you need to impress. Yes, there is. Who? What? Why are you so quiet all of a sudden? Uh, forget it, Jumpy. Yep. Chair that goes with the dresser. There's nothing particularly interesting about it. A wooden cupboard. There are cups inside, surprising no one. What about the light? It's light, even if it's heavy. It's light. I, uh, I don't remember what we need to do here. I was thinking it was something related to, uh, Okay, a collection of full and partially depleted rolls of toilet paper. Someone was well prepared. There's nothing too suspicious about it. Let's check the toilet. There's nothing there. The tank's empty too. There isn't even any water in it. Shower head. Feels dry too. That probably means no one has used it in a long time. Okay. Well, maybe the answer is leaving. What do you mean, why? I'm just going to go check up on them. Is there something wrong with that? Well, no. Come back soon. Why is... Alright, off to the other room. And it's the same... Well, okay, it's slightly different. A tile with a black and white pattern on it. There's a square tile in this frame. It's glued in there quite well. I don't think you can take it out. This is the bathroom wall. The whole wall is covered in these square tiles. Oh, hey, there's no, uh, no shower curtain here. This room doesn't have a shower curtain in this room. Well, um, there were shower curtains in the bathroom that June was checking out. You're saying this room bathroom doesn't have any. Yes, that's right. Hmm. There's probably a reason why. Toilet paper. We got two rolls, I guess. Is there anything in the toilet? Guess not. Tank's empty too. Looks like a valuable vase. Empty though. There seems to be room on the left side of the vase. There's room to the left side. Oh, oh, that's talking about the actual room. I was thinking that it was talking about there. there's room for something on the left side of the vase. Round wooden table. Nice wood. So, big deal, there's something on top of it. Oh, I'm coughing a lot. What's the candle? Candle with a candlestick. Might come in handy. Good for beating somebody. Oh, this is a display. This display. This is a display case. Check it out. These plates and shit look really expensive. You want to take a look? Yeah, let's. Come on, you stupid thing. Open. It's locked. Yeah, it looks that way. It might might be that dresser key. Okay, that's um. That means that there's another one somewhere. Otherwise, we aren't going to be able to open this thing. 
You're assuming that there's an answer to all this. Hey Junpei, that room's from Pretty Dark. Don't you have something that'll give us some light? Something that'll give us some light. Well, no, I don't have a match and matchsticks. I use these matches to light the candle. I get a lit candle. Awesome, with the light from the candle, maybe we can take a look around over there. But it gets so hot when I hold it. I want to put it down. Well then why don't you set it on top of the dresser? It's flat there, at least it won't fall over. Oh, yeah, good idea. Hey, it got pretty bright. It's almost like putting a light next to a mirror makes the light more effective. Let's see if this... Yes, yes, it worked. And it is a tile. It's a light, man. Can't you figure that out on your own? Hard to tell if it's burned out or not. Of course, now that we have the candle, I guess it doesn't really matter. There's a bed. There's an additional... Oh, here's the curtain. Two pillows in a pile. Oh. Pile of pillows. That's supposed to be some kind of joke? Hey, calm down. Anything under the blanket? Nope. Nothing suspicious here. Oh. Hey, what the hell? It just got dark all of a sudden. Maybe the candle got blown out. We should go see. There's a candlestick covered in melted wax on top of the dresser, and the... Unwaxed part of the top of the candlestick looks kind of like a key. All bumpy. Candlestick key. At least they just flat out tell you. And so now we open this. Yes. It opened. Alright, pull that shit open. And we take the additional plate, tile. Hey Junpei, you got a minute? Santa had shown up out of nowhere and gave Junpei no small start. Here, take this. Santa pulled something out of his pocket. A four-leaf clover bookmark. Looked like a bookmark, it had a four-leaf clover in it. What's this? I found it in between some of the cushions on the sofa. I'm pretty sure it ain't going to be any help to us, but I figured we might as well hang on to it. Anyway. And why don't you hold on to it? Santa gave him a wry smile. You know what I hate most in the world? I got four things. Hope, faith, love, and luck. Damn straight. And you hate these things? Yeah. You got a problem with that? Uh, not really, but Junpei tried to figure out how best to phrase what he wanted to say. What does a bookmark have to do with any of that? Santa scratched the back of his ear and looked awkward. Well, see, each leaf on the four-leaf clover has a meaning to it, okay? That meaning is pretty much those four words. It's like a flower language. Well, I guess it's not a flower, is it? So it's a leaf language, I guess. Yeah, you could call it that. Call them leaf words. Leaf words. Junpei looked at the bookmark. Hope, faith, love, and luck. Yeah, I want you to take it, okay? Just touching it gives me the creeps. Take the damn thing, alright? Anna pretended to shiver with disgust and shoved the bookmark into Junpei's confused hands. Junpei, what do you want to do? Now I suppose you could decide not to take it. That's the incorrect decision, but I mean, you know, decide to take it after all, why shouldn't he? Alright, sure, I'll take it. Shoved the thing into his pocket and gave the sand a last confused look. Ew, man, I feel a lot better now. It was real pain, you know. You really hate those four words that much? Yeah, well, they can all betray you, you know. Hope, faith, love, even your destiny. What had happened to Santa? Junpei wondered. How had he become such a bitter person? He he's an emo teen. How the fuck do you think he became such a bitter person? For a moment, they looked at each other. Well, that's not my only reason. What? That's not the only reason I hate the four-leaf clover. I just can't bring myself to like the number four. What, worried about the four horsemen? 
No, come on, man. That's just silly. Maybe back in the Dark Ages, that kind of crap scared people. But this is the 21st century. And I'm a 21st century guy. And why do you hate four so much? Because it's a half-ass number. Not the best or the worst. That's why. What? Nine is a way better number. So what if it's last place, right? At least it's not some lame-ass middle number. Santa's explanation, much like almost everything with Santa, made no sense. Junpei was even more confused than before. You play? Play? You mean like gambling? Uh, yeah, of course. What else would I mean? In Baccarat, the best possible hand totals nine. They call it Le Grand. The lowest, most worthless cards, the zeros, they call monkey. Just like the guy in charge of this game, huh? Zero's a monkey. Santa blinked, utterly stunned. Then he began to laugh. Oh man, you're totally right. The guy who topped us, trapped us in here, sure is one hell of a monkey. That was when Lotus spoke up. You know, if you think about it, the Nonary game is really is, is really a lot like Baccarat. Apparently she'd been listening. Of course, it doesn't use any of that stupid digital root junk. You just drop the tens digit and that's it. Still, it does have the same idea of your final number needing to be a single digit. Oh yeah, I guess you got a point. In both games, whoever has nine wins. The person who makes nine wins? Did you forget already? Don't you remember what Zero said? The exit is hidden, but it is there. Seek a way out. Seek the door that carries a nine. Actually, that's that's not true. It says seek a door that carries a nine. Now I'm wondering if any of the other things are slightly different. I mean, I've already noticed that it, it says we will call them the, the numbered doors as the very first line. So. so, if we want to get off this boat, we have to make a team whose numbers have the digital root of 9. And only the people in that team are going to make it out alive. Of course. That's why it's called the nonary game. What? Huh? You don't know? Nonary means something derived from 9, or base 9. It's derived from the Latin prefix nana, which means 9. While we're at it, the prefix for one is uni, you know, like unicorn, the horse with a, uh, with one horn. Two is bi, like binary. Binary means composed of two parts. Three is tri, I'm sure you've heard that one plenty. Rio, triple, triangle, you get the idea. After that, you have court, kinti, sex, septum, and so on. And of course, the prefix for eight is octo, like octopus. I called that because it has eight legs, get it. I appreciate that, um... Lotus is talking down to us very, very much right now. So the Nana means nine. Lotus nodded. So how many of us are trapped on this ship? No, Santa, that's wrong. Santa says that'd be nine. But one of you guys already fucking died, so it's eight. And what are the bracelet numbers we have? They go from one to nine, really eight. And our time limit, how many hours did we have? Zero said nine hours. And finally, to get out of this ship, we need to find the door with a nine that's hidden somewhere in the ship. <sighs> Excuse me. By making a team with the digital root of nine, Lotus nodded again. And there you have it. The number nine is everywhere in this game. He's got a real theme of nines for this whole thing. No wonder it's called the nonary game. Somewhere far away, Junpei heard the creak of stressed metal. And it almost like Zero laughing at them, or the sad, desperate scream of a pig headed to the slaughterhouse. And that is honestly about all that my voice can take right now. Even with additional water, I uh, appear to have let my uh, voice get uh, a little bit more dehydrated than I should have. That's just an emergency backup save. Uh, but that is going to be it for me this time. I'll be back with more of this on Friday. Probably with more uh, more liquids to drink while I am doing it. So I stay more hydrated. And I'll be back with more MS Saga. Uh, it'll probably just be the showing off the overworld encounters I haven't done and the... 
uh, actual final boss. Actual final boss post-game dungeon final boss for that. So thank you for watching. And uh, I will be back tomorrow. <laughs>